Well, so what is this conference about? This conference is about proving the geometric Langlands conjecture for GL2. And, uh, you know, so we want to prove that two things are the same. And what, you know, we're, we're put on our algebraist hat. Whoops. I guess that's why they don't like this. We put on our algebraist hat. And uh, how are we ever going to prove two things are the same? Well, the idea being put forward is we want to like, write down generators and then check that various relations are satisfied. So the idea is generators and relations. Um, unfortunately, what we have here are categories, not say algebras or groups. Um, so we have to figure out what these two words mean. So for us, generators, there's some way of like writing down uh, you know, objects of the category we want. So really what this means in the categorical setting is compact generators. And we have various procedures for producing these. So there are some words that have been thrown around. So there are words like Eisenstein series, which hasn't really been talked about, but at least it's a word. This is the function it plays. There's, uh, OK, have I been saying it wrong all my life? Opers, not oppers. I don't know. What's your name? I, I thought it was like operator. Yeah. So oppers. <laughs> <laughs> that's how I, OK, that's how I feel about opers. Oppers. <laughs> 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 I know. <laughs> so, and then, so we have Eisenstein series, which is something about reduction to parabolics. Um, and then there's uh, this word and Katz Moody localization, with, where this is something Dennis kind of spoke about yesterday, and Nick will speak about this afternoon. Um, and these are like ways of writing down. And Dennis will speak about this word tomorrow. Uh, and there are ways of writing down objects. You expect them to match up. And so at least you know what you expect to match up. And then you have to check relations. So this is like, OK. So here, this is like Homs between objects. Um, and again, categorically, it's it's very hard to check, like especially in this higher categorical world, you can't just systematically say uh, there's no way to do like, oh, for every two Katz-Moody representations, I compute this hum and this hum, and oh, look, they're the same. I'll keep iterating that procedure. So uh, it hasn't been defined. I know. Uh, there's a, there's an operation of geometric Eisenstein series. Uh, it, I, I don't want to. On, on both sides, there, there are operators of, of well, I, maybe Eisenstein series and spectral Eisenstein series are what they're called. Um, so, um, okay, and so the idea for checking relations just like what could you possibly do in this categorical setting? So you can embed into some. Great way to check to compute homs between two objects in general is embed into a larger category. So, well, we're in a very specific situation about D modules on Bun G um, and Voxis and all of this. So, uh, well, we have some. So the question is, what category are we going to embed into? And uh, Dario has given us a really good answer for D modules on Bungie. So he's taught us that there's this, I'm just going to write extended. Global is implicit. There's this extended Whitaker category uh, that we should embed into. And uh, I'll recall a little bit what this thing is, but it's something. Um, and then we are expecting on the other side, but it, it gives us a way of computing morphisms between objects because we've embedded into a full, well, embedded as a full subcategory into something larger. 
Um, so, okay, it's not always known this is a fully faithful embedding, but at least for GL2 it's known. And then there's this other category that, so, okay, I ran out of space, so, and coherent sheaves with support, singular support on the global nilpotent cone of the stack of local systems. So this notation, uh, at Dennis, I first saw this category in a note by Dennis in 2010, and then it was quasi-co sub n, and then it turned into indco sub n, and then it turned into indco nilp, and then it turned into indco nilp globe, and just keeps getting longer and longer, this notation for the same category. But uh, that's our, this is what we think the Langlands category is. And uh, Dima is, so, is going to tell us a category I of G check extended it's the notation. And uh, this will be some category. I'll say something very briefly about it. And then the idea is that, well, this category at least will embed fully faithfully into here. And now you want to say that we've embedded both our categories, the automorphic side and the spectral side, into some big category. And the upshot of this category is that it's something we find easier to compute with, for reasons I'll say. It's something easier to compute with than D of Bungi. For example, it lets us pass from the spectral side to the automorphic side with this functor. And, uh, and then the idea is, to show that this is an equivalence by showing that the generators on both sides match up inside of this category. So that's enough. Um, so Dennis will talk uh, tomorrow about how you check that these generators do match up. Um, globe. Global. Um, okay, so <clears throat> so the point of this uh, this extended Whitaker category, as opposed to just D modules on Bungie, is that it has a much more local nature. So in some uh, precise sense, it's mostly controlled by factorization categories, which means it doesn't really involve the geometry of the global curve except, well, in a more controllable way than D modules on Bungie does. Um, so, which is what like, allows us to do anything with it. So a brief recap of the structure of uh, the bottom categories. So first, well, we haven't said anything at all about the bottom right category. Uh, but so the picture is that you have this extended Whitaker category, and uh, Dario defined it as something complicated, but let me say uh, G is going to equal GL2. Uh, the really crucial thing here is that it's a rank two group. Um, so uh, the really, sorry, rank one group. <laughs> uh, so the idea behind this Whitaker category is that, well, Dario and Dennis this morning taught us that there's this uh, operation of Whitaker coefficient against a non-degenerate character. Remember yesterday during Dario's talk, there were, like, just in the case of the setting of functions on the Adelic GL2, there are, like, two real characters of N of A we need to consider, the character like 1 and any other character. And usually one deals with any other character and calls it non-degenerate. Um, and, well, and one can measure this thing. So uh, this embeds, I guess I'll write it like this. You can kind of think about it as an open. Uh, so it has some j lower star and j upper star functors. And this is approximately d modules on uh, g of a mod g of o, which are uh, equivariant against n of a with some non-degenerate character. Uh, so Dario taught us a way to make this precise using these, uh, well, using the Ron space and these independent categories. The, the Ron space and the independent category gives you a way of systematically uh, dealing with Adelic issues, um, which a priori don't make sense in algebraic geometry. 
Um, so, right, so then there was some like, okay, whatever the definition was, there was some open piece, and that was what corresponds to this Whitaker global. There was some giant space of rational maps and characters, and, and this was the open piece. Um, and then there's a second part, which uh, I am going to call W of GB. And this has a push forward functor and a pullback functor. Um, and it looks like sort of sheaves on a closed inside of uh, this category. Um, and this one wasn't really explicitly spelled out in the same way, but this is the major actor for today's talk. Um, and how did this work? So again, Dario had some space of rational maps, and uh, some things were supposed to be zero sometimes and not zero other times. And if you work out what that was, then the closed stratum, the part that corresponds to the degenerate character, was D modules on uh, what I'll write as just the adelic version, G of A mod G of O mod B of K, K being uh, our function field. And where literally this is uh, the moduli space of G bundles on the curve with a rational reduction to the Borel at the generic point. But then we are also supposed to impose some huge equivariance condition like here, but according to our character. And here our character is nothing. Like it's zero, that's the part we're on. So this is the N of A invariance. So we can think about this category. So the upshot of all of that is that uh, the way you should think about this category, so uh, W of GB, so W stands for Whitaker, by the way. Uh, so the way you're supposed to think about this category is as some kind of D modules on G of A mod G of O mod N of A T of K. So this is a metaphor because I only know how to implement this process of taking the uh, adelic invariance, not in the world of pre-stacks. I only know how to do it using the run space in some way. Um, so I don't actually have a pre-stack here that I'm taking this of. I rather have this pre-stack, and then I'm applying my process of taking adelic invariance. Um, so a comment is that, like, uh, set theoretically, one has the following equality, which should just be noted. So uh, this is what Dario already told us. So. Uh, yes. Well, you don't. You don't. Uh, okay. I don't want to necessarily take global sections. What I rather want to do is say. Well, I'll kind of remind the procedure, at some point, but let me say it this way. So. Uh, okay. If I want to embed. If I want to take n of a invariance here, then I know that that. This, I know what this category is. Sorry, well, D of G of A mod G of O. I know what this category is. It's D modules on the moduli of G bundles with a rational trivialization. And I know that category embeds fully faithfully into D modules on the affine Grassmannian. So now I impose some condition on D modules on the affine Grassmannian that will force this. So Dario said, when you pull back, if it's kind of N of A equivariant in the sense of, well, really being equivariant for meromorphic jets on, uh, over the Ron space. That was the, the upshot. Um, yeah, so I, I have the set theoretic identification. That gives a set theoretic identification. Yeah, so, so the reason for this is that just for the same reason that if I put G of F here, I would get G bundles. This is G bundles on the curve with a rational reduction to B. And set theoretically, evaluative criterion of, of properness tells me that that reduction to B extends because G mod B is compact. And uh, 
that says that set theoretically it's just the same as a B bundle on the curve. It extends uniquely. Um, so what that's telling me is that T of k, that this quotient is equal to the set of points of bun t. Um, but the actual category of d modules I'm getting are different. So the, uh, the honest geometric picture, so I just want to say this now, because I'll kind of want to appeal to it later, is that what I have is d modules on bun t on the one hand, and then I have this category w of gb, which remember is supposed to incarnate this. I have a, uh, a conservative sort of restriction functor and a push forward functor, and this is conservative. Um, so it shouldn't necessarily be that surprising that it's conservative because like if you have a map of algebraic varieties that's just like usual algebraic varieties that's an isomorphism on points like but maybe you know it's like an open disjoint union a closed then at least the pullback map is conservative yeah what f and k is the same i usually use f everyone else uses k so i'm trying to use k Uh, and, yeah, not at all. So actually, the, the picture is the one that appeared in Dario's talk, where what's where we're kind of gluing together a lot of different connected components. So like if G were uh, you know simply connected, something like this, so that uh, like bun G is itself connected, then this is going to have the same kind of connected components as bun G, but bun T has many. So. Um, so that's our, our geometric closed stratum. Um, and I, yeah, so I'm going to erase this part. It's still up on the board, but I want to leave the basic picture here. Um, so then we also have the spectral side. So here I said there's going to be some notation like this. So we know what should be on the right here now from Dario's talk this morning. Namely, this should be rep g check. What was the notation? Ron independent. Ron independent. And this was the morning. Um, and OK, one can show nice adjoint functors like this. Um, this category has not been defined. Emphasizing that again, that is the, the subject of Dima's talk after this. So. Um, and Similarly, well, what I want to discuss today is what should go in this corner. And, uh, oh. I'm lying, right? What probably actually appears in, in this category is quasi co of Luxus. Dima? Well, it depends how you set it up. Like for right. But the way. For GL2, it can you can force it, but Dima will set it up with quasi co of Luxus, right? Yes. So, in fact, it's well, it's kind of an important point. So, so Dima will set it up with quasi co of local systems for G check, and this we know embeds from the morning today and yesterday. <laughs> So 
today we learned, well, yesterday we learned that quasi cove local systems for G-check, for, you know, reasons that don't really have to do with representation theory, this embeds into the category rep G-check on the run space, um, or this independent category just as well. And then Dario taught us this morning that that independent category is equivalent to, like, for representation theory, theoretic means to the, uh, the Whitaker category for the Langlands dual group. Um, and yeah, so what I want to discuss today is a candidate for what should go in this corner and then some, some work in progress on how to show that there's actually an equivalence between these two categories. Um, so it's not just a fully faithful functor, it's an equivalence on this closed stratum. On the open stratum, what we have is a fully faithful functor, which accounts for a while, a long time ago. Now there was a fully faithful functor right about here. Um, so yeah, just in. It's it's not uh, quite that simple. It's more so. For example, for GL two. This, uh, the, the non-degenerate part remembers everything except for like the constant sheaf. So, so this part here is like, but, but still your functor isn't fully faithful. So if you really want geometric Langlands for the constant sheaf also, which, you know, is nice. It's telling you cohomology of bun G is seen by the stack of local systems in some way. Like, then you need to include this lower stratum also. Um, It, so it, it, it is, a, I mean, it is the principal series category, like the stratum is sort of, well, it's where Eisenstein series should really be sort of valued from. Yeah. And it's also like, well, it's what really, what the like sort of true constant term functor goes to. And uh, yeah, so this, this uh, so what we're doing is like, like, okay, the, the Whitaker coefficient remembers, like, well, you know, if it's a modular form, it remembers all of your, like, coefficients except for A0, and now we're remembering A0 also. So. Yeah. Maybe you should just wait to see when the statement, but you have ref G on the right hand side and something is with the other thing on the left hand side, so why don't you be in the category that? Uh, you mean why, why not put ref g here and force something that like is literally equivalent? Yeah. Yes, good question. The answer is I could do that for GL2. Uh, I, I guess, well, Dennis and Dima are thinking about the higher rank case and they don't know what to do in rank above one. Yes. So what, what they produce for a general group has this as the open stratum. So they have some stratification by the parabolics and this is the thing that appears as the open in that. So for GL2, it would be enough to make two things that are actually honestly equivalent. But I just want to uh, be consistent with Dima's next talk. Other questions? I Wait, it was the, the last comment. Is that the thing? I was saying you could put rep G check here and then force an equivalence between these two categories. I'm not saying that it's the same, but you could produce a different category here that, would, that you could say is literally ex equivalent to the extended Whitaker category. It's not known how to give a spectral description of this uh, for general. It's, there's no conjecture for a general reductive group. There's only a conjecture that defines some category like this and a fully faithful functor to here. Um, it's not to say it's impossible, but just that's what will be done in the next talk. <coughs> Other questions? OK. So <coughs> uh, so here's the uh, rough, uh, uh, intentionally imprecise version of the con conjecture. of the conjecture we want to talk about today, which again, what we're really concerned about are these closed strata for today. Um, so 
or I mean for this hour. Dima will talk about uh, how to glue things together in the next talk. So what it says is that this is equivalent to uh, I'm not going to write a name to a category yet. I'm just going to write the idea of it. Quasi-coherent sheaves uh, with, uh, well, quasi-coherent sheaves on the stack of local systems for the dual Borel uh, with a connection <coughs> along the fibers of the map Loxus B check to Loxus G check. So LS and Loxus are the same. Um, so what, first of all, just like, what, like very quick recap, what could I possibly mean by connection along the fibers? Like what am I just trying to say here? Well, I want to say if you have like some vibration, then there's a notion of like, you know, in, in differential geometry, you could talk about a sheaf not just having like a connection by all vector fields, but just by vertical vector fields for some vibration. So that's the kind of thing I have in mind here. The problem is that this is really, really far from being a vibration. Like, it's not a, a closed embedding by any means, but like it, its image is a really small closed subset of Loxus G-check. It's those local systems that admit a complete flag, the like maximally reducible ones. Um, <coughs> so I need to give an actual definition of, of this category. So my way to do it is with uh, the ROM games. So uh, definition is that if I have some map from one pre-stack to another pre-stack, I'm going to define y dram over z to be what? So I take y dram cross over z dram with z. So uh, just to spell out what that means, <coughs> so I, well, I, I'm going to do a, a brief bit of a digression to, to talk about this stuff, just so it's not. Otherwise, it's going to seem like just totally arbitrary what I end up writing. And I want to kind of try and keep it from feeling that way. So OK, so why do I write this formula? So first of all, y dram over z of s. Let's just work out what that is really quickly. So it's a map from uh, s to z. And then I take s reduced and lift it to y. Um, so in other words, well, I have like an honest map to the base, and then I've sort of contracted the infinitesimal fibers. Um, well, I've kind of contracted everything in the infinitesimal direction along the fibers. Um, so for example, uh, formation of this, this pre-stack, y dram over z, it commutes with base change in z. Easy to see. So the fibers really are like dram of the fibers. Um, so some examples. So one example is that uh, if, let's say, if y is equal to z, then I just get back y. If z is equal to a point, then I get back y dram. Uh, if I have a picture like, uh, let's say, s cross t mapping by projection, so this is my y, this is my z, this is the projection map, then what I'm getting is s dram cross t mapping to T. And finally, actually, I'll put it on another board. <coughs> um, <coughs> One other thing that's going to look kind of weird if you're not used to derived algebraic geometry is that if, like, OK, let me just write it as a closed embedding of schemes for simplicity. Uh, so this is my y, this is my z then what that's going to go to is actually the formal completion of t along s. So that'll be my 
S Durham over T. Because what is this formula saying in that case? So it says I'm supposed to give a map from S to T that at the reduced level factors through S. Oh, too many S's, sorry. Um, but that's the definition of the formal completion. Um, so, well, yeah. Yeah, if you, if you do this kind of picture, well, I, I, I don't really know how to explain it in classical terms. I only know how to explain it in derived algebraic geometry terms. And even then, I don't have such a good like poetic interpretation of it. I tried thinking of one to give for this lecture, but it's more just like, this is a fact. <laughs> I mean, this, this is what the formula produces. So it's, well, l l he, okay, here's one thing that's happening. So let's say S is a point and T is a variety. So I want this thing to commute with base change in like the truest possible sense. So I want that if I'm base changing to my given point, I should be getting that point Durham, so in other words, a point. And the reason why this thing isn't just like, say, S, is that the fiber product S cross S over T could be something, well, it, it, it'll be something crazy in derived algebraic geometry, even though it's a closed embedding. But the product, well, so the product with the formal completion will just give you S. Yeah. Yeah, well, the, yeah, exactly. So. Yeah. You make the tangent space. What? It's the same. You make the tangent space. Of, you make it on the reduced part look like S, and you make the tangent space look like the tangent space at T. And so if you're mapping to point, you're just killing the tangent space. If you're embedding in a closed thing, you, you're adding formal direction. Right. Thanks. That's good. Yeah, well, right, but it's, it, yeah, it's, it's kind of hard to make a convincing argument for it. And I mean, you can also just say, like, it's the quotient by the relative Durham groupoid. Like, you would expect that. But the thing is, the relative Durham groupoid for a closed embedding is something huge, because you're taking those fiber products, and that's where it comes from. So yeah, so it's some mix of, like, for a smooth map, it really is a natural notion of, like, vertical vector fields. And for like a closed embedding, it's um, something like formal completion. And in general, it's something that feels both of those aspects. Um, so, <coughs> so what that means now is I can define uh, various categories. Like, remember, what I want is a notion of quasi-coherent sheaf with relative connection. So. So I can define a couple different options now. So one thing I can do is I can take quasi-co of y Durham over z. Another thing I could do is take inco of y Durham over z. Um, so OK, so, so you might think at first pass that these two categories will be the same, because we learned quasi-co and int-co of Durham, y Durham. It's the same. But we very quickly see that's not the case, because what we have here is the formal completion. And quasi-co and int-co behave very differently for formal completions. Um, moreover, neither of these categories will be what I want. Um, so uh, let me just quickly give the definition. So I'm going to define, uh, well, so, it, so this is something I basically won't consider. Um, this I'm going to define as intco with connection along z, connection over z of y. Um, 
So meaning incoherent sheaves with a relative connection. Um, and so w what are the basic properties of this category? Well, let's actually, let me ignore it for a second. So now let's say that y is a algebraic stack. Um, and I'm going to assume it's what's called eventually co-connective. This term hasn't been used yet, right? So uh, by definition, what that means is that locally, so I'm going to write down a technical condition. Uh, and you'll understand in a minute why it's used. So locally in the smooth topology, or flat topology on Y, it's of the form uh, spec A, where remember we're in derived algebraic geometry. So what I'm going to require is that A is equal to, uh, well, so, so A is some like complex of vector spaces concentrated in non-positive degrees. I require that uh, HI of A is uh, equal let's say, not equal to 0 for only finitely many i. Ooh, how about this? hi equals 0 for i sufficiently large, sufficiently small. h minus i equals 0 for i sufficiently large. That's the best way to say it. <laughs> so, I, so for example, any usual algebraic variety, any usual algebraic stack, like classical algebraic variety, classical algebraic stack, these are eventually co-connective. So uh, uh, here eventually refers to the fact that I say for all i sufficiently large. And co-connective uh, is, uh, well, it's a term imported from homotopy theorists. Um, but it refers to these kinds of bounds on, on cohomology or on homotopy groups. Um, so. Uh, OK, the upshot of that, of that condition, so let's say for S a scheme, a eventually co-connective scheme, um, yeah, I should say this condition is also, it's, in some ways, it's where like, you can do a lot of derived algebraic geometry just with the perspective of usual algebraic geometry and schemes. This is the first kind of technical condition where you're always really careful and have to, well, learn a new technical assumption on your schemes. So for S and eventually co-connective scheme, so for any scheme, finite type, I'm going to assume, I have this functor int co to quasi co called C. So remember, this is end of co of S. And C is the unique continuous extension of the embedding from co of s into quasi co of s. So in other words, you think about an int coherent sheaf as some formal gadget formed out of infinite direct sums and cones of, uh, of coherent sheaves. And you just take the corresponding quasi coherent sheaves and take the corresponding literal direct sum and cone, or whatever. Uh, for now, scheme. It's not actually going to be any different for stacks. I'll just state it. But for now, let's just be in schemes for the sake of my sanity. For example, this identity can fail for stacks. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And uh, OK, so for algebraic stack, I have this definition. I want to play out a certain game for schemes. Um, OK, so, we, so with the eventually co-connective assumption, by the way, I, oh, I probably should have said this. Anything that's locally a complete intersection is eventually co-connective. Because it, well, Kozul complex, thank you. Kozul complex and finitely many odd generators. Uh, luckily, those odd generators can only survive so far. Um, OK, so with the eventually co-connective assumption, there's a second functor. Dennis calls it C. And this goes from quasi-co of S 
uh, and it's fully faithful, and it goes to INCO of us. And it's constructed by the same procedure, namely, it, I have to tell you what it does on perfect complexes. And here, you just map it, you, you say, my perfect complex is coherent, no problem. Like, who even needed to worry? So, uh, comment on that in one second. Well, the, the most basic fact here is going to be that, uh, <coughs> that C is left adjoint to C. It's easily, easy to see. And note that, uh, that, that perf is only contained, well, saying that perfect complexes are contained inside of coherent complexes, this is equivalent to the eventually co-connective assumption. This is like pretty unfamiliar when you just think in terms of classical algebraic geometry. But the fact is that the structure sheaf is always a perfect complex. Um, but the structure sheaf could have infinitely, well, on the one hand, the structure sheaf is supposed to be uh, a perfect complex. On the other hand, coherent complexes are really required to be bounded complexes with like finitely generated cohomologies over H naught. And like, so, point is OS might not be bounded. Uh, the eventually co-connective assumption says that it's bounded. Um, OK, so now the fact I want to use is that the exact same picture goes through for algebraic stacks. I wrote it carefully in the notes, I just ask you to take it on faith. It's not, you just reduce by smooth topology to exactly this picture, by smooth morphisms. The, the main point being that for smooth maps of schemes, well, or whatever, the upper shriek functor is, you can think it's the upper star functor up to tensoring with a line bundle. So it's just, it's a very simple functor. Um, so now I can make the following definition. So I'm going to define, so I have this map of algebraic stacks. I assume Y is eventually co-connective. And I'm going to define quasi-coherent sheaves on Y with a connection over Z. By definition, this is going to be uh, like the set of Incoherent sheaves with connection uh, such that F, well, okay, I'll write something. Forget F should be in quasi co of Y subset int co of Y. So, what does the formula mean? So, here, Obliv is the forgetful functor from incoherent sheaves with connection to incoherent sheaves with no connection. Which makes sense because remember, this is defined as inco of relative Durham. And you check the formula, relative Durham, what was it? It was some fiber product. Y maps to that fiber product. Um, so it's shriek pullback. OK, so this is the definition of some category. It's, it's neither like this category nor the category of quasi-co on this relative Durham space. That's easy to see if you look at the case of uh, formal completions. So in general, this category actually, it has nothing to do with, uh, with like uh, quasi-co of the, well, quasi-co of that relative Durham space. Like there's no functor in one direction that could possibly be an equivalence. Um, 
There is in the quasi-smooth case, and then Dennis and Rinkin have studied the failure of that functor to be an equivalence very closely um, in unpublished notes. Uh, okay, so what's the point? <laughs> What was that? If z, is a point. if z is a point, then it is equal to that category. Then, then quasi-co, int-co, and this category are all equal. Because we're, everything in sight produces d modules. You take some. Um, OK, so. Uh, am I? Uh, am I lying? Uh, probably. Yeah. The question is actually, if z is a point, am I actually getting back d modules on y with this category? So I have y some eventually co-connective stuck. Z is a point, and I'm taking this relative quasi-co connection. Yeah, but I'm taking int coherent sheaves. I'm asking that they lie in the image of C That's under the forgetful functor. It is true, but why? Uh, if it's not Gorenstein, then the uh, then the dualizing sheaf won't lie in the image of that functor. So maybe I want Gorenstein for this. What do you mean? The, so the dualizing sheaf is going to map to the dualizing sheaf in int co, and saying it's in the image of this functor is equivalent to Gorenstein. For in practice, yes. So at least if at least if it's quasi smooth, I'll get back the right answer. So. Right. But so he's okay. Okay. So what he's saying is this. Okay. Well, it's, okay. it's a technical discussion. Maybe we can leave it until afterwards. Let me just say what the issue is. So if having those are right the modules, and when apply the right forget the function to get to get to get quasi code. So that means that on the Gorenstein scheme, that's always the case. Uh, because it's yeah. basically, it's basically a line bundle. That's, that's the idea. In general. OK. So, Gabo, here's the proof for you. How do you get the right D module? You forget down to the left D module, and then you always get the quasi code, and then you tensor by epsilon. This one is line bundle. <coughs> So this is essentially well. Right? So there is left forget function, right forget Left forget function is position maps to quasi code. If you get to the right realization, it's tensor by omega. In this case, omega is a line bundle. So this is probably a really poorly, well, it seems like a really poorly behaved uh, definition if you don't have something like quasi smooth in sight. But it's a definition. So the question was. I was going to pose this, why do we want this category? So here's the issue. So well, first of all, the conjecture now says that in the specific case when y is locus b check and z is, well, so maybe I'll write that out and then explain why we want the category. So. Conjecture is that quasi-co with connection over locus G check of locus B check. Note all of these stacks of local systems on curves are quasi-smooth, so we're in no problem. So we have no problem of the type we were just discussing. This should be equivalent to this category W of GB. So this uh, sort of universal donor for principal series. Um, so that's the conjecture, and uh, I guess during the discussion session we can talk about an approach to proving it. And uh, and well, what I really want, whoops, is that this should be compatible with Fourier Mukai. So remember, I said we have adjoint functors like this from the category of d modules on bun t where this functor is conservative. And similarly, well, I know that this category of d modules on bun t should be equivalent to, well, is equivalent through Fourier Mukai to quasi-co of locus t check. And 
what I really want here are adjoint functors like this. So let me just tell you, <coughs> well, in order to get those functors and to have them to have the right properties, we need to use this category. So here's how the functors are defined. So, uh, so the, well, so the right adjoint is going to be given by the following procedure. So we take this category, quasi code, nabla over loxus g chuck, loxus. Well, let me. Okay. So I can take loxus b chuck, uh, Duram over loxus g chuck. Now, oh, I actually can just write a formula. Let me do that. Sorry. So I can take quasi co with connection over uh, loxus g check of loxus b check. By definition, this is a full subcategory using this functor c of int co with connection of loxus b check. Then I can forget using that functor obliv get an incoherent sheaf on loxus b check. And then I can use uh, my push forward functor. Oh, sorry, I'm, I'm doing something strange. You're totally right. The whole point is that I have that this forgetful functor, sorry, is giving me a forgetful functor down to quasi co of loxus b check, which is now embedding in through c. And from here, I can map by a functor that could be called Q spectral star to quasi co of loxus t check. And here, because I'm going to t. So if I want to induce down to loxus g check, I take the realm cohomology along the fibers. Um, yeah, so here, Q spectral is the map from loxus b check to loxus t check that takes a local system with a complete flag, um, like a horizontal flag, and takes the associated graded. <coughs> what was that? I only care about the left part, right? So now, why did I need this particular category? So first of all, uh, an observation is that, well, so I have, well, OK, I want to expand this diagram a little bit. OK, so the first observation, which is easy to say, is that this Q star spectral is conservative. In other words, it sends no non-zero objects to 0. Um, so why is it? So proof is that is roughly that the fibers look like uh, copies of loxus n check, and this is like approximately an affine space mod a unipotent group, affine scheme mod a unipotent group. Mod unipotent group. So Dennis explained this, I think, yesterday in the case of GA. Otherwise, I, my n is filtered by copies of GA. And OK, this is a generalized vibration with something. Um, it's filtered by things that look like that. And the point is that push forward along an affine scheme is a conservative map, certainly. Um, and then push forward for unipotent groups is also actually conservative when you work in the derived setting. Well, not even derived. Like This is the familiar fact that if you, like if we were on BGA or BN, I'm saying that like the, if you have an N representation, then it has some N invariance. Um, Yeah, but the, but that's not that's not your geometric constant term. 
It's the spectral line. But on the geometric side, not to have the same thing? Uh, no. Because then, like, you have sheaves on A1 whose cohomology, like, D modules on A1 whose cohomology vanishes, like the exponential D module. It's quasi co. It's important that it's quasi co. Um, so that's one observation. A second observation is that, uh, well, this functor admits a left adjoint. So what is it? So first of all, I can take Q up Q spec up a star to get a left adjoint here. I just do pullback in the sense of quasi coherent sheaves. And then I claim that there's a left adjoint here of induction and that there's actually a left adjoint here of induction as well. And this was our, our reason for wanting to use indco, is in order to have this left adjoint, you wouldn't have it for quasi-co. And uh, here, the existence of ind from indco nabla over, uh, over, what is it? OK, blah, blah, blah. No, OK, indco of locus b check to Indco connection over locus g check to locus b check. This functor is given by a uh, Indco push forward. The point being that, as Dennis explained yesterday, the fibers here are, uh, you know, DRAM of of some some stacks. So, well. We have complete control over it. Um, so we have this nicely behaved indco push forward due to this exhaustive work with Nick. Um, so, okay, that sets up the the theorem. I'm out of time, right? Okay. <laughs> so I've done the global thing. I stated the conjecture. Should what? Should this conjectural potential to No, it looks completely bizarre. <coughs> uh, but is there any explanation from the, 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 uh, there's, there's, we can explain. So, OK, so it's just a red So what is this guy saying? So, OK, OK, let's, let's cloud. <laughs> OK. <laughs>